Hey everyone, Jeff here, also known as the Revit Kid. Welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. We've got a bunch of folks already joining us from all over the place. Uh, thank you for joining us. This uh, this is a weekly live show uh, here on YouTube where we talk about Revit and uh, any really associated software, BIM in general, but um, you know Revit and, and associated software. Um, today I've got a great guest, John P., uh, which I'll introduce in a little bit, uh, talking about Dynamo and deployment and management of scripts and all kinds of cool stuff with Dynamo. Super excited. John is always uh, full of awesome information. Um, for those of you who uh, it's your first time joining us, thank you so much for joining us live. This is really cool. Um, I know uh, this is a different time for some people. I usually do this show either at 12.30 Eastern or uh, six, uh, sorry, 7.30 Eastern, depending on uh, not just the guests, but also maybe my schedule that day. Uh, but also it's to help um, some folks maybe in different parts of the world who want to check it out live who maybe can't. Um, I know uh, those of you across the pond there in England and Europe, um, I know you guys always are welcome uh, uh, when when uh, when I do this 1230 show. And so welcome to you guys as well. <laughs> um, and if it's your first time, make sure you subscribe um, for sure uh, to the channel here on YouTube. Um, that's how you'll know the best when when we go live as well as the next uh, premiere also head on over to the revitkid.com and uh, and check out um, check out my content there um, and you can sign up for the mailing list and you'll get a bunch of um, a bunch of reminder emails and information about the show as well um, last but not least uh, if you are interested in seeing this is actually episode 32 believe it or not a uh, 32 yeah episode 32 <laughs> so this is episode 32 i started this show uh back in march uh sort of at the beginning of quarantine it was um really just kind of a happy hour at night and i think uh john and aaron were one of my first guests so uh we'll we'll, we'll, we'll bring aaron back again he's been back a couple times um but uh but yeah so this is episode 32 if you're interested in seeing any previous episodes um you could head on over to live.bimafterdark.com um, before we jump into the content, um, I wanted to, to take a pause and, and give a moment of, um, of information on actually our sponsor for this show. Right, so BIMBOX. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of BIMBOX before, uh, they make desktops and laptops for the AEC community. Um, I, uh, you can't see behind. Well, actually, you'll be able to see behind me in a second. <laughs> um, I've I've got the desktop, the Striker Two, and one of the coolest things about BIMBOX um, and why I was so excited to partner up with them with the show is that um, their computers, especially the Striker Two, was designed and developed specifically for Revit. Um, so. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of hard to find um, computer companies that were designed and built for Revit um, and the AAC industry, and this is one of them. Um, I've been working with these guys for six or seven months now, um, using all their products, especially the desktop. And I, I can tell you from experience that the, these things crank. Okay, so let me uh, let me jump over to my face real quick. You can see the BIM box behind me there. That's actually the striker too. Um, uh, a couple a couple little housekeeping items about BIM box. Um, they they have a three year warranty. Um, they deliver orders in 10 to 14 days, which is phenomenal for essentially custom machines that are really good. But again, my biggest thing with these is um, over the years, I've had so many questions um, via email. I mean, I've been doing this for 11 plus years blogging about Revit. And one of the most common questions I get is definitely um, what computers should I buy? And so I finally have an answer um, where I can say comfortably that this this computer was built for Revit. Um, as I mentioned, I've been testing these things out um, hardcore on lots of different projects. And um, uh, I, as much as benchmarks are great, and you can head over to bimboxusa.com um, uh, slash TRK or um, BIM After Dark, uh, or sorry, bimbox, uh, dot BIM After Dark dot com to check out more information. They have a great benchmark tool. Um, as much as I love benchmarks and I understand why they exist, to me, it's all about feel when it comes to computers. And I could tell you right now, um, I, I test these things and I need to feel how they how they how they handle models and uh, these things crank. Um, so check it out um, if you're interested. Um, you can email sales at bim after or sales at bimboxusa.com or head on over to um, bimbox.bimafterdark.com. So thank you so much for sponsoring this episode, guys. Um, and if you guys are looking at uh, looking into new Revit machines for you or your company, definitely reach out to these guys. Phenomenal stuff. So without further ado. I do want to in, 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 uh, <laughs> introduce our guest. Um, he's been waiting around patiently while I did all of that. So 
let's uh let's bring in uh my buddy john john pearson what's up man oh i think i think you're muted well, I muted myself while you're going. Right. I didn't know. <laughs> That's all How's good, it going? Uh, I'm doing great, dude. How are you? <laughs> doing good. I promise. I know how to to use uh, Zoom and <laughs> web meetings. <laughs> it's almost it's almost so it's almost so embarrassing now when you forget to unmute just because it's all you do is you're on Zoom calls all day long and then I, I do well, yeah. it too. I did I did it this morning actually and you're like oh. That's such a new move yep. now, right? I mean, <laughs> for sure. Well, I'm, welcome, I'm gonna dude. make a shirt that says, "Can you see my screen?" <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. For those of you uh, who don't know who John Pearson is, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit. Maybe uh, John, give a a little a little bio on yourself, and then we'll we'll start jumping into some content here. Yeah. So uh, I have like a slide, but um, I'm a design technology specialist at Parallax Team. Uh, I'm a Revit user. Uh, I've been using Revit for a while. <laughs> uh, my first Revit version was 2012, 2013. Um, I, I know that's not terribly long, but we are getting to the point where people like Jeff and I are meeting these way younger people than us even. <laughs> we're like, my first Revit version was 2019. And we're like, okay. So yeah, um, I've been using Revit a while. Uh, I use Dynamo. Um, I started out in an architecture firm building Revit content and then uh, started using Dynamo in 2014. And then um, it all just kind of took off from there. Most people know me uh, from Dynamo packages I make and things like that. And uh, I just I like to have a fun while I'm learning all this stuff and just mm -hmm. hacking at stuff too. And you'll see that on my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> John, John is being a little humble. Um, your Dynamo package is is probably you know, one of the top five that everyone should install. And it probably is the top five on the downloads list, but it's probably one of the top five that people should install because it does utilize, uh, uh, or I should say, uh, most of the scripts that people are going to write are going to benefit from some of your custom <laughs> notes, I would say. Um, and uh, that is the Rhythm Package. I don't think you said the name of it. So John is the yeah. creator of the <laughs> Rhythm Package. And I did actually want to mention, um, if uh, you might not be able to see it on oh, here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this right here, this is actually my, my DIY Dynamo, which is a course I create on Dynamo. It's my cheat sheet. Um, and so, um, you guys can download this if you head over to free.bimafterdark.com. Um, I couldn't, for some reason, my 11 by 17 wasn't printing, which is super annoying, but, um, you'll notice uh -huh. on the bottom, if, when you download it, that, uh, I have six packages as must installs and rhythm is definitely one of them. <laughs> so thanks uh, for that. I dude. appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for John, sure. John is also, um, uh, extremely accessible on Twitter and super helpful for you guys, um, um, he's always willing to, he's always been willing to help me. So thank you for that, John, when I get stuck on some stupid list, uh, combination or something that just doesn't make sense in, in Dynamo, uh, John is always there to bail me out. So thanks, bud. <laughs> for sure. Uh, so, always so, glad so, to help out. Yeah. So, um, so John and I, uh, we're trying to talk about, uh, a, a month or two ago, what, what exactly we wanted to, to, to chit chat about. Um, the last, uh, Dynamo session I did was a little more beginner and it was just myself sort of talking about how you can get started and jump into Dynamo. Um, and, and so we were trying to figure out how we should play this. Uh, and, and John's been really interested in, um, deployment management and organization. It seems like of, of Dynamo scripts. And I believe this was an AU class that wasn't, wasn't accepted, I think. So, uh, so we thought yeah. it was better <laughs> to use that here because why not? Right. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I had told you, um, the class was titled the presentation au doesn't want you to see and um we didn't go with that title so no, no, um, we, we didn't but... go with that title i, I you know I, I love i love my autodesk <laughs> friends and i don't want to upset anybody but i thought it was pretty funny um so with that i guess i'll let you jump in um i want to remind everyone out there this is live so ask questions as much as possible in the chat i'll be following along and and john is willing to get interrupted and chat about whatever it is that that piques your interest so don't be shy make sure you ask some questions i know i will be so um, with that, John, I guess um, if you want to just jump in and, and, and get the juices flowing. Sounds good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this presentation, it was actually scheduled for Built North America and Built Australia this year. Um, but, you know, with everything going on, uh, it's just it didn't happen. So maybe next year, right? Um, my family are all Cowboys fans. So I always tell them, like, this is the year that I know how a Cowboy fan feels because I keep saying maybe next year. <laughs> um, I'm not a sports fan, uh, but my, my family is, and I like to make fun of them for stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, this is a little about me. I make some dynamo packages, um, rhythm, a uh, pretty popular one. I started building that in 2015 and never imagined it would be where it is today. Uh, bang and monocle. And we'll look at some of those today. 
I always like to share our team um, from the company I work for, Parallax team. Uh, this is what really makes us so strong is having this team of awesome people. So this is our whole team right now. We have a few other people that we uh, collaborate with, but I always like to share a slide uh, to show you why it's a Parallax team, right? So, uh, so as Jeff said, uh, I've been working on Dynamo for a while. Uh, sometimes it feels like this to be learning Dynamo. So I always like to share my journey as well. Uh, I didn't wake up one day and all this just made sense. Um, it was a struggle. <laughs> and so when someone's saying they're trying to learn and they're having a heck of a time, I'm right there with you. I, I feel you. Uh, so in 2013, I opened Dynamo and I closed it. Those were when the, the nodes were yellow. Um, kind of was nice, actually. I kind of liked them. <laughs> uh, but because um, now yellow means error. So it's a little freaky. Uh, but I opened it in 2013, closed it because I didn't know what I was doing. And they all turned red. And I was like, I'm never going to learn how to use this, period. I even told my BIM manager at the time, I'm not going to learn how to use this. I was very discouraged. And I was like, there's no way. And these have auto slide transition for whatever reason, but whatever. Um, 2014, I learned it at AU from Marcelo. And then the rest is on here. And I'll share this data set after this too. Um, and now I primarily uh, make stuff for Dynamo and C Sharp. Um, so quite the journey going from I'm never going to learn this to building tools that other people are using to learn and build. So it's pretty fun. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little overview of my history. Once again, if anyone has any questions, I have the chat open too, so just ask them. Uh, I always like to review what Dynamo is, where it was and where it is now and where it's going. Um, so if you're still using Dynamo 1.x or 1.3, uh, just stop, please. <laughs> um, 2.0 has been out for a long time and that's what this presentation will cover. If you're on 1.x, 1.3, whatever, it's time to move on. Um, it is any of what we show today, you can rebuild it in older versions, but uh, it's a lot easier if you don't, <laughs> if you just download the files and just use a 2.0 version. Uh, so maybe in the chat, someone put um, what version of Dynamo you're using right now too. That'd be kind of interesting. Uh, if you're on question, a 1.x, <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, one question I had that that I get quite often is, because um, I, I, you know, the one thing that's good, but also maybe dangerous with Dynamo is is how often packages are released or updates are released and builds are released, right? I know there's the core builds, but there's the sure. builds. And so um, even even when I'm when I'm teaching Dynamo, for example, um, you know, the, the difference between a 2.0 versus 2.1 versus 2.3 versus you know, 2.0, 0.3, you know, that kind of stuff, um, you know, how how much should people uh, focus on that, care about that? I mean, just should you always just make sure you're on the latest build is kind of what I'm getting at. Is that, would that be your that is a great suggestion? <laughs> yeah, so generally speaking, we build towards the latest stable build when it comes to graphs or packages. Um, we'll get into that here too, um, the compatibility. So if you're on a 2.x, you'll notice me say a lot, mm -hmm. if you're on a version like that, you're going to be compatible from pretty much Revit 18 to 21 generally speaking. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty wide gap now. Mm -hmm. um, there's this concept of semantic versioning that we'll look at too on these slides. So yeah, that's a great question. And we'll, um, I'll show you kind of how that works too. Awesome. Um, yeah, Dynamo 1.3, This I'll hand this out to everyone too. They use something called XML. The nodes look different and the library looks different. Uh, 2.0, let's just start using it. Um, it's a little weird that there's still people on 1.3, but there are. <laughs> Um, they use something called JSON, the library is nicer and the nodes are nicer as well. So we'll get into some of that. Uh, um, real, real quick. There was a question yeah. actually that, that I think is before we move on too far. Um, Amy, yeah. thanks for joining Amy. Amy is actually part of the BIM after dark community. So awesome community member. Um, she asked, uh, what made you go back to it after you opened and closed it two years ago, whenever that was, or 2014? Oh, that's or an <laughs> excellent question. Because yeah, I don't so, think you mentioned uh, it. You said you closed it, and then you eventually went back, but I don't think you mentioned why. <laughs> that's right. So um, 2013, I, I stopped using it or whatever. And then 2014, I went to AU, so Autodesk University, for the first time. And being fairly stubborn, <laughs> I was uh, I registered for all the Dynamo classes that said Dynamo in the title. And in 2014, there were maybe like five there wasn't a lot uh one of them was from marcelo scambaluri who does the um revit complex blog 
Uh, his was uh, Dynamo for Dummies. And I was like, hey, I'm a dummy. I, this class is for me. <laughs> so I took that class and he showed how to map parameters together. And that just changed my way of thinking. And when I left AU 2014, I was like, I can use this. <laughs> um, so that's what happened. And uh, I went back to my firm in December after AU. And I started building graphs that were like mapping arrowhead types in our template and setting text types and things like that. So like not sexy stuff, right? Mm. But very, very practical stuff. And then in uh, February of 2015 is when I started bundling those, those workflows into a package called Rhythm. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's really what kind of like helped me out was being in Marcelo's class. And for him to illustrate probably one of the simplest things, setting a parameter from one parameter to another, yeah. like a one-to-one, Yep. <laughs> like it just clicked and I was yeah. like, oh, I don't have to be modeling towers or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's one of those things that I think, yeah, you, once you see an example that clicks with you, then you're willing to try it on, you know, that example or maybe to make something that similar. And then that's when it opens up the floodgates, right? I mean, that's, it seems to be the story for, sure. for a lot of people. It's like, oh um, man, like that's the example I always give is the duplicating views and assigning, you know, part plan type of thing. You know, that's just one of those things where that's a pain point with like every single person on the planet who's using Revit with, with buildings that are X size, right? They're making part yep. plans and they're duplicating views to do it. And so when you think about some of those things and it's a re repetitive task, it's easy for people to conceptualize, right? And then, and then it's like, boom, it clicks. Now they're, they're sold. And then they're trying Dynamo for literally everything, even stuff that they probably shouldn't be using Dynamo for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes like a schedule filter or a Revit schedule will do a lot more than you think. <laughs> right, right, right. That's my yeah, first it's, question it's... too these days is when people ask me, I'm like, first, let's see if you actually need to use Dynamo to do this. And then we'll try it. In Dynamo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's definitely a balancing act. So yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad awesome. someone asked yeah. it. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, in regards to versioning, so Jeff, to answer your question, uh, semantic versioning is a process um, that is, and if I can open that link, I'm going to screw it up, aren't I? It's used by software development um, people. So the way it works, you'll see Dynamo's like 1.3.4 and so on. Uh, the way semantic versioning works is the first one's a major release, the middle is a minor and a patch. So like this middle number will sometimes mean that you add stuff that's like not backwards compatible. So like in the case of like 2.6.0, which is current for Revit 2021, mm -hmm. they'll add new nodes or something like that. That means that if you go back to like 2.0.3, those nodes won't work, but the core functionality will. Mm -hmm. So um, they adopted this to version their stuff. So that's why the versioning is kind of weird sometimes, but as long as it's generally speaking, and people will probably like hate me for this, but generally <laughs> speaking, if this first number matches, you're pretty good. Um, you're pretty safe. So that's kind of a, a thing to know, especially like I imagine a lot of the people on the um, live stream are like the dynamo champion for their firm. Mm -hmm. It's good to know this when you're the person that people approach and say, can dynamo do X, Y, Z, you know? Mm -hmm. um, or, so just or, one why of am I, or why am I opening a graph and there's all these things and errors and red boxes and all this yes. stuff, why, you know, then you can start analyzing maybe why that's the case. <laughs> yes. Or in the case of like Dynamo 2.0, if you open a 1.3 graph, it says the Dynamo graphs corrupt. Mm. Really <laughs> poor choice of words, but it just means you're opening a newer one in an older version. So like <laughs> that comes up on the forums quite a bit. People are like, my graph's corrupt. And it's like, no, it's just they use not great language. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, here's a bunch of packages to install um, as well. I always share this slide. Uh, we'll go through a few of these. Uh, all of them have cool logos, so that's always fun. Uh, I did learn. Um, I did learn today that Lunchbox is a little bit harder to find now. So you'll have to look that one up. That's still on my suggested packages because I use it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll need to go to their website and kind of look at that. It was on the package manager for Dynamo, but you'll have to kind of look at that some more and find the version. So that, that is something while prepping for this, I found out. So kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. I think we'll just get right into a project if that's fine. Yeah, let's do it. I have slides, but slides are boring. So, yeah, why not? Um, this is live stream, right? Let's have some fun. <laughs> so we'll remember, everyone we'll there, <laughs> you guys feel feel free to ask questions. Anyone who's here at live, uh, you know, we'll, I'm I'm keeping an eye on it, and and we're 
we love answering questions <laughs> for sure so yeah revit 2021 is what i have open right now go to the manage tab and we'll open dynamo um so uh one thing that i always like to kind of share and tell everyone is you need to annotate your dynamo graphs um so we'll go over that as we work through this uh but if you don't use groups and color coding like we're not friends. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, just do it. So um, one strategy we've adopted, and I've learned this on the forum years ago, uh, was we use a Dynamo template. So like in Revit, you use a template. Um, in Dynamo, you should also use a template. The problem is you click new and I can't choose a template. <laughs> not great. Um, yeah. So on the forum, I don't, I still can't find who showed me this. Everyone keeps telling me I showed them and I'm like, well, I learned it from someone else that I forgot. <laughs> so if you're on the thing, let me know too. Um, but what you can do is um, you can click. So on your home screen of Dynamo, you can actually click show samples folder, which is down here at the bottom of my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, you could click on that and actually add folders to this folder that ships with Dynamo. That's not right uh, so protected? We, a read protected? Uh, oh, no, sorry, write protected? I'm surprised. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you can make it read only though. Yeah, so that yeah. way you don't save over your templates. Yeah, yeah. But uh <laughs> yeah, it's right in the program data. Nice. Uh so what we do at Parallax is we put a folder with an exclamation. So it goes to the top called template. And we just have a generic um dynamo template embedded in there with some of the color coding that we use. Nice. Um so this uh, is really let nice. Let me ask you a question about it, because that's really cool. I've, I've when you first sent me the snips of the you know dynamo template. I was like, oh, he's going to show us that he made a template for it. That's super cool. I knew because, mm. you know, you're, you work with Aaron and you guys are all about templates. So I knew there was going to be a template. But <laughs> uh, yep. when I saw that, I it was super neat. Um, the one thing, the question I had then is if you're using, I didn't realize you were using the sample fo folder, which is super cool. Um, the question I had is what happens with updates? Is that, does that folder get, get, get refreshed when you do like a brand new version of Dynamo, a brand new install, or it's something that you have to manage manually? Yeah, so it is part of your deployment strategy to manage this. Uh, the other idea is you can have it on your network and just train people to start with that. Um, we manage this stuff with startup scripts. So we use a tool a tool set called PX Tools. Um, and that we have a whole thing on our website about it. Um, Aaron's in the chat, so you could probably even paste a link or comment mm -hmm. on it. But we use it to where when our users, so the four of us or we have more than four computers, by the way. But uh, <laughs> whenever one of us logs onto our machine, we actually sync our Dynamo graphs, our packages, our templates to our machines. Okay. Um, so when a new Dynamo update comes out, uh, which is now bundled with Revit updates, mm -hmm. uh, we kind of prepare for that and account for that. Uh, that was, um, was going to be my next thing was that, how are you managing it now that it's bundled with Revit and you can't even like manually say, hold on, I'm not ready to update Dynamo yet. <laughs> yeah. So we handle it along with our Revit updates as well. Awesome. So that's kind of how we do that. Um, one thing I'll show here in a second is um, if you don't know how to do startup scripts or any of that kind of stuff, you can just use Dynamo to copy this stuff. Um, Dynamo is a command line interface. That's so pretty, pretty awesome. So we'll look at that too um, for this specific thing. Um, yeah. For this as well, uh, being a consultant um, who shares files, I kind of embed a license just in it, a generic like free use license. You don't have to do this part, but uh, we publish Dynamo graphs on our website as well. And they're for you to learn from, they're not for us to be on the hook from forever. And if it like, they shouldn't, <laughs> but if they jack up your Revit model, like don't come after me, please. <laughs> so right, right. Uh, that's kind of what a license will do. It also means that it's open source and you can use this graph mm -hmm. for whatever you want. If you want to go make money off the graph, go for it. If it has a license that permits that. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing like as a Dynamo champion, you might start to learn about is um, uh, licensing. Licensing is a big thing. Uh, Dynamo is uh, Apache and MIT, which are open source licenses and packages are a whole slew of different things as well. So it's kind of a boring topic and something asked me five years ago, are you going to be nerding out on licenses? Uh, I would have told you no. And now I'm like, what license do I publish this under? So it's very much a consideration now. So, so I guess, and that's definitely not necessarily about the rabbit hole I want to go down, but I do have, I'm, I'm, I'm interested since you guys do consult with a lot of other companies, um, you know, how, how are, you know, 
when you're implementing or, or, or teaching maybe a company to implement uh, some of these scripts, you know, how, how has the reaction been with IT departments and the, the security side of sort of that? Or is there, you know, how, how are you working through maybe, oh my God, this, this is open source. It's got, like you said, this, this, this weird license stuff yeah. I don't understand. And now you want me to install this on everyone's machines. Like, like is there, is there yeah. a route that you guys have taken to sort of ease that? Yeah, so um, generally speaking, we audit um, packages that we're using in graphs that we ship people. Um, we pay attention to what's in there. So if they're open source, so like some of the popular open source ones are like Clockwork, Spring Nodes, um, Archilab. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of look at to see what they're doing as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll suggest those. Generally speaking, pretty general. If it's available on the package manager, we'll at least consider it. Mm -hmm. If I find a package I have to go get an installer for an EXE somewhere, mm -hmm. I'm less likely to install that. <laughs> um, so it's nothing personal. It's just mm -hmm. as a consultant, if I go into someone's firm, I'm not going to say run this unsigned EXE. I promise it's okay when I don't even know, you know, because it's not mine. <laughs> um, generally speaking, people are pretty darn honest. Uh, if you stick to the top package list that we kind of showed earlier, um, you're safe. Um, I'm not interested in taking anything from anyone or anything like that. So <laughs> any of my stuff, like, uh, it's fine. Um, the, the, the internet is a scary place. So, uh, that being said, I can't speak for every package on the package manager and <laughs> say that they're all fine. Yeah. Uh, but the ones that we primarily use are, um, awesome. so yeah. And then a question had came up in the chat, uh, regarding the viewport location node and it's named this now. So, okay. Um, there used to be another one that was like viewport location, and then I changed it to location data. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just answer that one while we're at it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I think that was, uh, who asked that? I just saw it too. Um, uh, oh, Immy. Im 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 <laughs> well, there you go, Immy. So yeah. <laughs> yep. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all good too. So in regards to deploying this, uh, one question we get a lot about packages is how do you like deploy those to people's machines. So if you don't know, um, packages actually live in your roaming app data primarily. In Dynamo, let's see if I can do this without messing myself up too much. We'll go to roaming Dynamo. Okay, cool. So roaming Dynamo, Dynamo Revit, and all your versions. Uh, so this is where your packages live out of the box uh, at Parallax. And for all of our clients, we sync them locally. Uh, that's important because if you have a laptop and you disconnect from the network, you have your packages locally. You're not hooked to some network location or something like that. Uh, people always bring it up if you go to settings, I think. Where is it? I never use it, so I don't know. So if you go to settings, manage node and package paths, you can actually map a network location here. I have seen this have more problems mm -hmm. than anything else in Dynamo. So we just always embrace using the out of the box app data location and we sync those through other means. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like a deployment thing there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you're, so you're using a third party of some sort to sync that specific yeah. folder location directly on a local drive versus against probably a server location or something like that, right? Exactly. So ours are on our server. That being said, you can do this with Dynamo. So I'm going to show that. So let's see. I mocked up my package locations on another folder. So this is like pretend right now. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is we're in Dynamo Revit right now. If I go to help about, we'll see that it says Dynamo Revit. Uh, Dynamo also ships um, what they call a sandbox version or a core version now. So if we go to Dynamo builds... Uh, this is how they get out the latest and greatest now. So as we said earlier on Revit 2021 and up, you can't just install Dynamo. It just comes with Revit. But if you're desperate to see the newest stuff, you can um, install the core runtime. So we'll actually run that right now so that way you can see it. It's pinned on my taskbar, so I'll just fire it up. Uh, it comes in a zip file. You unzip it, and you can just run it. Um, you can even run some of it, even if you don't have an Autodesk product installed, which is kind of cool. I was just going to say to to maybe clarify for some people um, who maybe are not familiar with it, what John's saying there is that you can run Dynamo just as Dynamo. It doesn't have to be attached to Revit. And so 
the exactly same running so, is literally you can just install it on any windows machine in theory and and, and run it but uh but it's not the, the thing here is it's not linked to revit it's not linked to your current active document in revit or in, exactly in revit. yeah so in sandbox you'll notice that there's no bin or node library called revit so this is sandbox uh, this one specifically is dynamo 2.9 uh, it doesn't have a Revit version here because it's just sandbox. Uh, but what we can do is we can actually start to build some logic to do some copying. So this one's already a done graph. I kind of hate when people do that, but I did it. Um, <laughs> what we're doing is we tell it where our deployments live for our packages. So that's where ours are. It's a um, UNC path. Uh, we get the person's current app data uh, that has to be done through a Python script. So that's just in this file as well. And then uh, we can actually copy the contents of your deployment out into a directory. Uh, so what's kind of cool is uh, I mapped this out to not be not replace my packages live on this call because I don't want to do that right now. Um, you can actually trigger this with the Dynamo command line interface. What you can do is create a shortcut that runs when your user logs in with this graph, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's super um, so that's all in there for you. You can actually follow through with this and build it. So what we can do is I'll open my mocked up folder here. So we'll go to desktop and I'll just make a shortcut. So new shortcut. I'll give it that command. So what I do is tell it to launch the Dynamo command line interface and then tell it a graph to run. And then I'll just name it, I'll just leave it Dynamo command line interface. So what will happen is, we'll go back to my desktop and we'll double click that, is we'll start to see this running a command line that's running a Dynamo graph. This isn't any other code <laughs> besides Dynamo, which you can do. And what it's doing is it's copying the package folders for me into this, this mock package location right now. You can point to the person's app data though. Um, so it loaded my Dynamo graph and it's actually working through and it'll keep going through each package folder. Uh, what's cool about this is you could embed that shortcut as a startup script in your Windows logon. So you can invent your own solution for managing packages locally just using Dynamo. So if you don't know how to code, big deal. You know how to use it's Dynamo. Dynamo. Um, you can make it work for you. So this will keep chugging because it's copying like, if anyone knows Mesh Toolkit is a massive package. So like, it's yeah, it'll be running for a while. Yeah. So I'll just leave that running in the background. My fans <laughs> going nuts. So t but, Tom, Tom just asked, yeah. um, can this work if the packages are stored on a Dropbox instead of a server? So what's kind of funny about that is if you had them stored on a Dropbox and you have that syncing to people's machine, um, you could probably just access that location. Hmm. Uh, because funny it's, enough cause is it's that because it's local, so Dynamo would be okay. It, it's technically it's local, right? It's it's syncing exactly. So you could just point yep. Dynamo to that that Dropbox location on your local drive because you're not. So so is the issue you think um, point when you're pointing to map servers? That's that's the issue with the packages, not necessarily pointing to a different location within a local machine. Yeah, so I think if you pointed to like a, cause right now I'm copying to a OneDrive location actually mm -hmm. um, on my machine, which is syncing. Cause I, right, I build right, presentations right. on OneDrive. Um, as long as the files live somewhere, even if it is a network location, uh, you'll be fine. And then um, on startup, it would try to copy those. Mm -hmm. So that's um, right now I'm copying those from a network location. That's um, a UNC path. So that's, what's kind of interesting. The, the path I'm copying them to is a local directory right, and not right, a right. UNC. Hmm. So yeah, that graph will be in the data set as well. Um, that way you can do that. Awesome. Um, Ryan also had a question, which is, uh, <laughs> I guess it's unrelated, but it's related to the sandbox slash um, studio, Dynamo Studio. He's asking, can you, can you, do, can you create geometry in, in sandbox or in the studio? Because it's not linked to Revit, for example. Yeah, so you definitely can. So the whole geometry library is still in there. Um, I you have to test out what you have access <laughs> to in here. Mm -hmm. um, ASM, so Autodesk Shape Manager, is a thing that comes with Revit and other tools. I think Dynamo is pretty integrated with it. I might be wrong, and Saul or some one of the Dynamo team people can weigh in on that um, separately if they needed to. But uh, 
you could just be modeling things in here. So Sandbox is popular for things like the generative design tool as well, mm -hmm. um, because it's multi-threaded, Revit's not, and you don't have to depend on Revit just to start shape-shifting stuff. So I've done a lot of things in here to where like, I'll model stuff as well. So like, we'll do a slider. And we'll show something kind of cool here too. So this is 2.9. Uh, so this is a cuboid. This is a geometry in Dynamo that we have access to see. Uh, so that's my beautiful building, right? Uh, in 2.9, if I hold down Alt and click on the input, it'll actually suggest other things to use. Um, so I typically would use a number slider. So we'll go ahead and use that. You read your mind, And then man. it's connected. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's crazy. The machines are learning, right? Uh, so what we're able to do is start kind of shape shifting this really quickly. And then if you alt click on the other one, it'll suggest others and it automatically connects them. So this is in 2.9, which means hopefully it'll be out in the next Revit update. Uh, but you could start building this geometry out really easily as well, right in sandbox. Mm -hmm. uh, to get this into the Revit version, you could save this graph, open it, and then it end up baking that into Revit somehow. And that's a whole nother topic as well. Right. I, I was just going to say the, the limitation there is that you're dealing with dynamo geometry, which is you know, its own little thing. And, and if you want to interact with Revit, you have to take a little bit of a different approach after you've done all this work. It's kind of, as yeah, opposed to if you absolutely. started in Revit, you're, in theory, you're already starting it with that connection. And that's how you can go back and forth between geometry within the Revit environment. Super cool. Though. For sure. And there's a lot of different packages and ideas of getting geometry into Revit. It can be anything from SAT files to real family geometry to uh, NURB surfaces, all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff. It's uh, it's a little higher on like from beginner to advanced. It's a little more on that side, right? Towards mm -hmm. the advanced side of things. But uh, yeah, you could be mocking this stuff up really easily in Dynamo Sandbox. And I actually spend a lot of time in Dynamo Sandbox more than I ever imagined hmm. uh, because I build view extensions for Dynamo, which are add-ons. So like all these icons you see on the ribbon right here and right here don't come with Dynamo. Uh, those are from my view extension monocle. Um, so like we're building 3D stuff. I want to see it kind of lined up and nicely how I would like in Revit. So I added some we call them uh, stored views, I think. <laughs> I forgot what I called them. It's 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 John P's view cube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's my version of view cube without being a view cube. So it's kind of funny. Um, in addition to that, like this little canvas thing that you see, um, I'm not a huge grasshopper user, but I have used it. They have this kind of alignment thing. So like, I'm all about making your graph suck less. So like, if it's lined up it sucks way less. Right. And if you <laughs> add groups, it's even better. Uh, so that's with the view extension monocle as well. You have that little in canvas alignment tool. So what I'm trying to do is take away any excuse to not annotate your graphs. <laughs> so these tools are free on the package manager. It's from uh, us at Parallax and you can start to do some cool alignment stuff as well. Yeah, and by oh, the way, anyone who's probably furiously taking notes for some of these downloads, we'll have uh, John will send me any links you guys need. I'll put them in the description of the uh, of the video here on YouTube. But I'll also put them on the blog post uh, at the Revit Kid tomorrow. Um, so we'll we'll make sure that anything John mentions you have easy access to. And I'm sure I haven't seen yet, but I'm sure Aaron, if he hears anything, he, he's going to be sharing links during the chat too because <laughs> he's furiously sure. replying to chats there. Um, one thing I guess. Awesome. Uh, um, I was interested in is is if you want to maybe just quickly uh yeah the the template looks awesome and i like the idea that you have here um and without you ever even explaining it to me i sort of get it already of how you're managing the sort of group so maybe just run through real quickly um how how you've sort of decided the these these group colors and what they mean kind of thing because i think it's really 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 cool and is going yeah. to be super helpful passing graphs on i mean that's that's the whole idea here right is is we're trying to figure out how to make it easier if i handed if I sent you John P a graph that I created, um, you know, how can you, how can you understand it without, uh, you know, 17 million emails from me explaining? <laughs> yeah. So a few years ago, this blog post was published on the Dynamo um, website. Um, so 2016, holy smoke. So yeah, a little while back, um, this was the first time I saw anyone color coding the graphs. They at the color coding the groups. Haven't been in Dynamo forever, actually. It feels 
like something that's been there all along now, but it wasn't. So they added that. I don't know which version, but they added it. And uh, this firm, White, they um, they figured out how to make it a template for themselves. Um, Brian Ringley did this as well when they were when he was at Woods Bagot. He had a whole template that he shared on the Dynamo forum. So when I saw that, I was like, oh man, like as a consultant, I want to make sure my graphs are very clear as to what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I kind of adopted some of these colors. Um, I, I don't really backgrounds gray cause it blends in. So like, you know, kind of makes sense the rest. I mean, I don't really know why I picked those colors. I, I will tell you that, um, they are mapped to monocle. Um, so whenever you are using monocle, those colors match those groups. So if you use our template, you're good to go <laughs> mm -hmm. right out of the bat. I added this green one recently, so it's not in there. Um, but we can look at how to add that in a minute. So, so as you're like show, placing... uh, maybe just show people real quick how that works. Cause I think uh, what you're saying is when you create a group, that's that color, it automatically fills in. Is yeah. that, that it fills in the title, which is super cool. I mean, it's, it's neat. So let's do a, a like I'm sort of leading the witness example. here, but I, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, let's do like a little dual example here. So awesome. why we don't use drop downs as well. <laughs> so what we'll do is uh, we'll say walls and then I'll say all elements. And this is a right click search, of course. Mm -hmm. So we got all the walls. I don't have any walls placed, but we'll place them. Beautiful. Cool. So I have some walls that I'm collecting. Uh, since I am kind of OCD, I can line those up. And then I can say that this is an input because I am inputting some data into my graph. Um, additionally, if I right click on this categories, I can say it is an input for Dynamo player. Um, so that way people can use your graph without opening Dynamo, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's kind of how the grouping works. You can also not use this little dropper and just use this little like action command over here. Um, that way I'm telling someone that's something you might want to look at. If I were to start doing things like get parameter data from it or something like that, I would um, kind of tie that in and then I'll say, I know that that's a parameter, a valid one. So <laughs> I'll type that in and we can see that we're getting something. So if I don't want people to really pay attention to this part, um, I would end up making that like a background. And then I would come in and maybe say like, describe it, kind of tell them what you were thinking or tell yourself what you were thinking when you open this in two years, right? Sometimes your code will explain itself too, which is nice, but yeah. Um, so that's kind of like what we'll work through on our graphs. Another thing that we're able to do is with monocle, if you select groups and you go to align, you can't align, you can't align groups with the out of the box alignment. It aligns all the nodes, but with monocle, you can actually align groups. So it's nice. kind of cool. Um, so clean, make your code clean. Like don't come and do, don't do whatever <laughs> this is. I've seen that a lot. Uh, I've done that a lot too, so I'm um, not completely innocent. <laughs> are um, you so using, that's kind of um, how we'll start to. <laughs> you, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're we've all we've all made some some hideous graphs. <laughs> um, the uh, are you using uh, notes too within it? Uh, the actual notes tool? Or are you trying to put as much as you can in the group because they're harder to? Well, the, the thing, yeah, what I'm getting at there is I think with with notes, what I've found is because if you ungroup or something, you, it can get lost in the mess if you're using the notes. Yeah. You know? so, so I'm curious yeah, how, just you're, kind of, how you're kind of managing that. For sure. So to expand on notes a little bit for people who don't know, if you hit control W on your keyboard, it'll drop a note item within Dynamo and you can add additional notes to this. Uh, so that's how I do these things up here because a group with that much text would be crazy. <laughs> Um, so we'll use those to describe some of the logic as well, or like where a package or where a node came from or something like that. Or what I like to do a lot and Dynamo, the Dynamo team kind of did this themselves is uh, I used to put like the original node name if I rename it. Hmm. So like if you double click on a node uh, note, you can rename it. I'd put the original one in a note above it. Like if I like renamed this for whatever reason, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of fix that in the recent version, um, but also yeah. just kind of ticked me off too, because I don't like this yellow. It looks like an error to me. It does, yeah. Um, <laughs> but what they did is they added that they toward it still shows it. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of a problem for someone like me. So like, <laughs> I have a node that gets type parameters, um, 
and I rename my nodes when you place them for rhythm with a prefix, mm. but it triggers that now. So all my uh, nodes look like they have a problem. So it's like, it just hurts my feelings. That's a, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll get over it. But yeah. Um, but that's actually a good one point. thing we so, use yeah, so, uh, on, on, on the same sort of note, uh, note and the same idea of, of how you have rhythm as the prefix to your, your custom packages. Are you, are you putting anything annotation wise to let people know what custom package is being used where? Absolutely. Yeah. So what we do uh, at Parallax when we ship a graph or anytime I send someone a graph on the Dynamo forum is I'll come in and tell them that this is from rhythm and then the version, whatever the version is. I don't even know what I'm on right now. Uh, but if you think I type that every time, you're crazy, right? <laughs> so what we do actually is we use Monocle for that. So we have a tool as two versions, uh, but what you do is it tells you what packages you're using in your whole graph mm -hmm. and you can actually annotate them and it'll apply the version that you have loaded. That's important like as a consultant or someone handing off graphs, mm -hmm. uh, because if it doesn't work and they're using an older version or a newer version, you can say it will work if you install that certain version, you mm -hmm. know, or you can revisit it. Awesome. Uh, it also has a keyboard shortcut control shift P and you can um, also see like the, um, the the cleaner version. I actually received feedback. I'm going to get on a bit of a tangent. That's okay. <laughs> but I received feedback about this, that it's not professional enough oh. from a few firms. Um, so I actually changed it. So now he's really professional. Um, <laughs> but uh, we made the other one called boring mode for that reason. So mm -hmm. if you're a little embarrassed to open a meme on your screen while you're working, <laughs> uh, feel free to open the boring mode, which actually has a few extra features as well. Um, a meme with Comic Sans. There's nothing better. Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I have a lot of people ask me like, why I do things like that? And like, I like to have fun while I'm building things. If I'm not having fun, like it's hard for me to keep vested in it. So I like to kind of goof around as well. Um, here, to kind of finish this thought too, what we'll do is we'll save this graph. So let me, oh, I just saved over my template, didn't I? Mine's not read only. Oh no. Uh, I'm sure I'll use those nodes again. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll use those nodes again. It's okay. So what we'll do is we'll do sample drop down maybe. So why we don't use drop downs um, for graphs unless I want someone to be able to change it. What I'll do is open Revit 18. We're going to go way back, right? We're going to take it back. Um, Dynamo is still on the Manage tab in Revit 18. It used to be on the Add-ins tab in Revit 17 and before. So it's mm -hmm. kind of kind of cool they brought it uh, onto the Manage tab to help you manage these this mess, right? <laughs> uh, so what I'll do is I'll open that same graph just to show that it is compatible. Um, we'll open it. It'll think for a minute. And if I built this graph for people to depend on, I'm now not in good shape because the drop down went away. Hmm. Uh, Revit versions categories change, and these are stored as just a raw number in the categories drop down. For what it's worth, I think this is fixed in newer versions of Dynamo, uh, but that doesn't help all of us who are on Revit 18, 19, 20, you know? 17, 16. Um, so what, <laughs> yeah, 17, 16. We still have stuff in 16 I, as well. Got, so I'm yeah. looking at them. I've got all, I've got from 16 to 21 on my machine because of for sure. the companies we work with. <laughs> yeah, my whole ribbon's full of Revit icons that I, look the same right now. It takes up so much disk space, dude. <laughs> Having that many versions yep. of Revit just eats away your disk space. <laughs> yeah, so big so, hard so, drives, everyone. Yeah. So no, this is great. So I'm, I'm curious to see. So what, what, what do you suggest as opposed to the drop downs then? Yeah. So what we'll do is I'll hit save. I selected walls again. I want to show what this does when I open it again in 21. Uh, so we'll close it and then I'll reopen it. Uh, anyone on the thing? Did I pick structural connections? <laughs> no, I did it. So um, that's bad. That can actually crash Revit depending on what you're doing on the back end. If you're like mm -hmm. build this whole magnificent dynamo graph that puts insulation around like puts fireproofing on a structural model. And now all of a sudden it selected your walls. Like now you're going to be really ticked, you know? <laughs> um, so what we do instead is uh, we'll actually look for this in the library. So under the Revit bin, we'll go to selection and we'll see that there is in here. I'm probably not even going to find it because I never actually. I was going to say, I can't remember way. the last time I actually filtered through the library like that. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to type by name. Uh, so this search is terrible. Uh, okay. 
I'll get more on that in a minute. So if you type in category and search, there's a category by name node. Uh, if you double click for a code block and put quotes, you're just telling it I want to input text, which is fine. You can also put a string node. So I'll put walls. I'll plug that in and we'll see that I have wall selected and I'll get rid of that clumsy drop down mm -hmm. and then I'll save it. So what's great about this is from Revit 21 to Revit 18 now, once again, I'll refresh that graph in Revit 18. Um, that doesn't break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's really nice because now my graph's a little more future proof. So making something that's way more deployable for your users is really important. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Another that's, one that's, that's, that's pretty huge. common. That's I'm sure yeah. tons of people uh, run into that on a, on a daily basis, yeah, you, especially going back and forth. <laughs> you, you should have uh, you should have been on the call when we realized the drop downs did that. It was like, <laughs> I'm we, sure you discovered it when you at least wanted to discover it, right? <laughs> yeah, like Aaron and I were on a call and we were like, I was like, Aaron, look at this, look what it does to your graphs that like we're sending customers this drop down thing, and we were like, we were we were we were we were livid. No, I'm you're, do, you're doing no, the we math. Were... You're like, how many graphs and how many people are affected by this? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like it's one of those like that jaws like that zoom where like mm. everything it, it was bad. So awesome. We started like looking at other ways. So like another node that's pretty common is element types. So element types are important for mm -hmm. if you want to select system families. Uh, there is no element type dot by name out of the box. There's one in Clockwork, uh, but that one we also have a solution for as well. Uh, um, I'm going to get it wrong if I do it from scratch. So I'll, it's included in the data set. Um, but if we go to drop downs, wait a minute. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble now. So what we can do is I have it in the handout, actually. So let me show that. So with element types, there is no get by name. But what you can do is you can actually type in code um, and I'll open this on my screen and type it in and tell it to find an element type with a code block. A little intimidating, um, but if you just save that on your clipboard somewhere and just always use it or put it in your template, your little Dynamo template, mm -hmm. uh, it's not so bad. So like the way it works and I'll, I always have to reference it. I'm not perfect at all. So mm -hmm. if we do DS core, this is design script. This is the underlying code for Dynamo. I can tell it types find type by name in assembly. I expect everyone to remember that. Just kidding. It'll be a uh, honestly, <laughs> copy paste it. Um, I'm not going to lie to you and pretend like I remember it always. But what that does is this is essentially the same thing. And I'll pick a wall type, actually. This is the same thing as me doing this. Yeah, I was just we'll going to say wall uh, types. that what I would do if I was using this is I would also have element types there when I'm creating it to figure out what the actual element type is that you're looking for. Cause you may not know the name exactly. off the top of yes. your head either. Cause there are quite a few element types. <laughs> yep. So knowing exactly what you're working with is really important. And if you select it with the element types drop down, it'll, it'll kind of tell you if you're really lazy, you can do like string from object on this and then do clipboard. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and then you could send it to your clipboard. And I think that'll still work. No, you'll have to delete the whole, the whole class so you can laziness is key it's important right um, so uh yeah no that's a, the amy had a great question um since you were showing design script she asked did you learn design script so i'd be interested to hear um your thoughts on on how much you learned or should know of the design script manual yeah so, so to speak. <laughs> yeah i think it's a it's good to start to be aware of if you're the power dynamo user at your firm um, do I want you to open up Dynamo and just make one gigantic code block that does a whole graph? I don't want you to, um, because you got to think of the next guy or gal who gets this graph. Um, but to just kind of answer the question, if you want to learn design script, if you hover over nodes, it'll actually tell you how to use that in code. So, uh, oftentimes we don't even use the node for category by name. So if you hover, it'll kind of teach you. So if we double click for a code block, we can actually say category and it'll, it'll do some prediction. And if you hit enter and then dot, it's predicting that because it's using that, it's called a class in code, uh, but it's using like that hierarchy to work down. So I'll click by name, hit enter, and then I could do a parenthesis 
and it kind of prompts you still. And we'll do wall spelled correctly, hopefully. And then we'll see that that actually, we'll put a watch node because it's not going to want to show a code block. Watch nodes are a good way to dissect your graph as well. Uh, so it'll tell me what I have selected. I have a wall. Uh, also, being a Dynamo user, it's kind of important to know what data type you're working with. So if we search for a node called type, it looks like this. It looks like a level symbol mm -hmm. almost. Uh, if we plug that in, we can actually dissect what we're working with. So this Revit.elements category, uh, this is my all elements a category node. If you kind of hover on it, it'll tell you what it's expecting. The category is less helpful, but you know. <laughs> but it's kind of it's expecting that category, so you know that that should work within it as well. Oh, I put in that. That was my String. bad. So, yeah, you put in the actual category. Mm -hmm. So now it'll it'll work that way. So this is one we use quite often in a code block. That being said, if you were to build like a whole Dynamo graph and you like select a bunch of nodes, you can right click and say Node Decode, and uh, it's erroring out right now because I picked a weird category. We'll have to look at that. Uh, but that'll help teach you as well for some of the code block stuff. Uh, one of my friends, Sean uh, Fruin from Sigma, that's his company name. That dude is a design script maniac. And that's a compliment. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> uh, he puts stuff in there, like he'll share a graph and like, he's like, oh yeah, this is using machine learning to place diffusers in a room because he's an MEP guy. And there's code blocks in there that are like, they're they're tall, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so a little think, impressive. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a great answer. I think I think the that's probably what I a similar answer I would have is 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 you don't necessarily I don't think it's necessary to be able to write design script from scratch to like note everything out, but understanding yes. it a little bit, understanding how it works and where maybe it could help fill in those gaps. Um, it is probably beneficial. I mean, I can tell you, me personally, the only time I've ever used it, or I ever do use it, is 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 when I find examples that that sort of suit my needs, that that help do things that I can't do within within graphs and and whatnot. So I think exactly. And I think to answer it for you, I think what you're saying is that you you can't necessarily sit there and write an entire node of code no. in Design Script without doing other sort of referencing and piecing together to even get something remotely workable <laughs> yeah like i could do some of it but yeah like admittedly yeah. i'm not gonna sit there all day and be typing it right there's right, even right. some <laughs> some really great things hidden in it and i don't have that as a slide i'm looking for it but if we do revit dot and it predicted geometry elements dot element selector i think mm -hmm. dot might be twice and i think if you do by element id I'll include this in the data set too, but like if we want to get a Revit element by element ID, there's no node for that and out of the box Dynamo, but it is hidden in the underlying code. So it's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. uh, there are packages that do that. So like if we get like an element ID of something, so like 2552, if I type that in in Dynamo, and we plug that in, It'll actually get that element for me. <laughs> so that's hidden. That's not in out of the box Dynamo. So one case that I will use it is in this case. So if I want to retrieve something from element IDs, you can do that. And you can also even do unique IDs, um, which element IDs are like, you know, like the driver's license of the um, elements in Revit and unique IDs are like their social. So one can change a little easier than the other, right? <laughs> so awesome. Uh, another Sorry. actually follow-up question from that is um, how about Python? So I guess similar question, but with Python versus design script. Yeah, so if you start out in Dynamo and you get this like object-oriented um, process down, which means we're working on objects. So in Revit, a wall is an object, and then it has underlining methods and properties to it. Uh, moving to Python is not terrible. Um, so like, let me scroll back. We'll see, and I'll, I'll share kind of more of my journey in regards to that too. Uh, I started working with Python in 2016-ish after I started making, or mid-2015, after I started building rhythm nodes because Dynamo just doesn't do everything and there's a lot of stuff in the Revit API. 
and Python's one way to get at that. Um, I kind of like made that transition by um, looking at stuff like Clockwork or Spring Nodes or Archilab. Uh, so it's a good thing to learn. And if you know of PyRevit, you can start to transition to building your own buttons in the ribbon that way too. Um, that being said, I moved to C-sharp. I took a coding boot camp that my wife found uh, to learn how to build C-sharp websites. And once I did that, um, I started learning how to code nodes in C-sharp as well. Hmm. And kind of led me to where I am building Revit add-ins now as well. So kind of like my journey uh, was like, Dynamo out of the box, some design script, some Python, some C sharp to primarily doing C sharp. Uh, so I think those stepping stones are there for pretty much anyone if you really wanted. Um, there's a ton of great stuff like install clockwork, just do it. Like if you don't have it, like what's wrong with you? Um, if you double click into a custom node, you can see their Python script. It's inherently open source. And then within there, you can start, this one's a crazy, I opened a crazy one. Yeah, you of opened a really good one there. <laughs> <laughs> this one's so easy. Look, no, um, you can start to see what they're doing. And um, I actually had a class at AU 2018, I think, that was about Python, getting started with Python and Dynamo. So that handout and that data sets on their site as well. And we can link to that. Um, but mostly just by dissecting. Uh, that being said, um, I guess to answer it a bit more, like, do I think you need to learn Python and C sharp and all that to just be successful in Dynamo? No, I think you just need to be aware of what's available to you. And that includes custom packages and things like that. Awesome. So, so we're hitting, we're hitting an hour, but I want to make sure that we, uh, we, we wrap it all up nicely and, 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 and sort of, uh, you can conclude, uh, a little bit of this deployment discussion. So I, I'm just going to sort of run through real quick what I've taken away from it so far, which is, um, you know, the creating a dynamo template is, is huge. I think that I love that idea. The, the, you know, having, having standards within it, like the, the grouping, uh, naming the groups, having a reason for those colors and names of those groups, um, uh, you know, and, and deploying that template as, as sort of how you start all your groups, notating it, etc. Um, you know, using, um, dynamo or, or some sort of, um, some sort of third party tool to make sure that packages and, and templates are up to date is another one that I think is really cool. It's, it's really important. So maybe do you want to run through uh, just real quickly, sort of if you had to choose like the three, four, five steps uh, when it comes to successfully uh, uh, handing over and, and deploying Dynamo scripts to other people, what, like, what, what would you focus on? Yeah, so if I'm handing a graph off to someone like on the Dynamo forum, so another one, like if you're not on the Dynamo forums, like go get on the Dynamo forums because there's a lot of great people on there to help. Um, I try to be as helpful as I can, like on Twitter and stuff, but uh, I, I am just one person. So the Dynamo forum, uh, there's a lot of people on there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like answering a question on the Dynamo forum, my number one things are grouping, mm -hmm. uh, annotating if packages are in use, and then um, it used to be indicating which version of Dynamo it was on. Mm -hmm. Back when uh, 1.3 was a little more pre uh, prevalent, mm -hmm. it's less of an issue now, but I, I'll oftentimes still say like, this was built with Dynamo 2.x or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's like a big one. Um, the packages thing, huge, because uh, there are some ways. So like, I don't have it open, right? I don't have any... I have like every package already resolved, uh, but even like the Dynamo team. So like if you go to view, show workspace references, they do some of that for you as well. So as you use like custom nodes, so we'll place like an Archilab node of some sort, they'll start to tell you, and I'm going to full disclosure, this tool's not perfect. Uh, but whenever you open a workspace that has nodes in it that you don't have, it'll warn you. But I always add like a note because like, if I don't, and I'll just hit control shift P, I know that that's going to carry through whether they have this tool installed or not. So even if you don't have monocle installed, this is just a text note, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a big one. I always include that. And it says custom package right in front, you know, like. I was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean when, when I think about any issues I've had, even on my own graphs that I made, you know, two years ago that I reopened now, I'd say that's one of the biggest issues is doing the, if you don't do this, <laughs> trying to figure out what custom packages you use to get it done and doing the doing the treasure hunt of like, 
even I've, I've even you know sometimes searched you know through the package manager website or something to look for the node within the package to figure out which package was yeah. and you got to find the, the the version so that's a huge one um exactly so, would you say that's probably one of the biggest issues that you see when it comes to to handing off is version support and, and pa- especially custom package and version kind of stuff or yeah yeah so yeah. custom package is like a big one and that's like why for our clients like we handle their dynamo deployments the way we do yeah um because i've also seen like it's a trend that i've seen a few people adopt to where what we'll do is we'll pick like a clockwork node so like this is a custom node it's stacked this mm-hmm. means it's python based or has nodes within it I've seen like a trend where people will actually like come in here and yank the Python script out mm-hmm. because Python scripts do stay within the graph themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll ship this to someone just like this. The problem is like now you're on the hook for this Python script. You don't just say install the latest version of clockwork. Right. Instead right. you have to be like, what does all of this mean? <laughs> you know? So, um, mm-hmm. that's why we handle it the way we do as well. Um, so yeah, just annotate your graphs, a big one. Um, that way people can know. So then I think uh, probably my last question, and I think this is probably a good place to sort of tie tie a bow on it, is um, as far as deployment and, and Dynamo player. Um, so, you know, that's what a lot of a lot of discussions I have with people are is I, I don't like if I'm if I'm a firm of thirty people and I'm not I don't necessarily want to teach all thirty people how to use Dynamo to run this graph. But I do maybe, you know, the player is possibly the answer. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, sort of in your opinion, you know, how, because once you're in the player now, um, some of these, even some of these um, uh, bulletproof type of measures that you're trying to put in place, uh, you know, if, if, if the person doesn't even know that Dynamo exists in the Revit, right, there's, there's no way for them yeah. to know why that's not playing. So I'm curious, sort of, uh, do, you, do you suggest using player? And then when you do, um, you know, what are the, what are the things that you put in place to make that easier for people, so to speak, or more yeah, functional so, or less likely to blow up type of stuff? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So Dynamo player is a really big one. We didn't even get into Dynamo player. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm sure we could do have, an entire kinda... session on that, but I did want to <laughs> just, cause I have a feeling people are thinking yep. that, right. It's, it's, this is all great for the Dynamo users and the people in Dynamo, but like, what about if I'm, if I'm in charge of deploying this, but I do want my 30 people that are, are in Revit working on this to be able to use this, you know, what is, what should I do? Yeah, for sure. So if you don't have people already like deploying package as well, that's where it gets more difficult, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in player, it'll just error out without telling you anything. So that's always fun, right? Um, mm-hmm. Oftentimes what I'll see people do is they'll kind of like, they'll ship the graph with like a little bit of like, like a text file or something telling what comes with it. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I have seen a little bit of success with, and I still need to like break this a little more, but like in Revit 2021, if you use the, um, <laughs> the generative design tool, Mm-hmm. I will actually run this real quick. Uh, we're not doing generative design in this uh, presentation, mm-hmm. but you can actually bundle a Dynamo graph. Um, you have to set some inputs. You can actually bundle a Dynamo graph and include the dependencies with it. Hmm. So I'm hoping this leads into working with a Dynamo player. Mm-hmm. Uh, that being said, and I'll find it, generative design. So by, by bundling the dependencies, do you mean that it's going to bundle that current version of those packages into that player? And you, in theory, you don't have to worry about it for that memorialized bundle? <laughs> yeah, so it should start to like, and I might have to add a drop down actually, but it should start to at least include those packages alongside. So mm-hmm. if someone needs to resolve those, it'll... I've seen yeah. Dynamo in the past. This one's not a perfect solution. Mm-hmm. I've seen Dynamo in the past resolve when the folder is located next to the graph, though. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of interesting um, yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah, it's I don't have this graph ready for it. But what you can do is you could start having those kind of next to it. So sometimes I'll, like, if you absolutely just have to ship it over to someone who's, like, not on your same mm-hmm. uh, deployment strategy, you zip it together uh, is kind of where I'm getting with that. Uh, other things that you could do is um, you would have to use a Python node, but you can have like a Python node that shows like a, it's in Revit, it's called a task dialog, I think, or a user message. I have one in Rhythm, but what you can do is you can kind of say like, hi, 
you need these. <laughs> so you could bundle this uh, like as a Python script, and then whenever you do run it, mm -hmm. you'll get this pop up if something goes wrong in player, right, and right. say, "Hey, you need to make sure this works." Other right. solutions are. Yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say. So at the end of the day, right now, I would, it seems like you need to, if if that is the case, then someone needs to be in charge of these Dynamo deployments and making sure that um, the users who may not be in Dynamo or ever touch it, but use the player because you've taught them how or something like that. Um, you know, you're 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 kind of using like those tools we just talked about, making sure the packages are deployed and up to date on everyone's machines and that kind of stuff, and and becoming sort of the firewall um, for, for that. You know, for that process yeah 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 okay. it's definitely a management thing and like mm -hmm. for dynamo player it's a bummer um <laughs> because they made it seem like it just works mm -hmm. uh but kind of where i was getting with it so let me go back to where that was and then we'll end it there yeah i, I would thought. say yeah the uh the idea and the and the goal of dynamo player is brilliant right but to your to your, you know the discussion we're having right now is showing that there's quite a bit of flaws to it because you're you're running just you're basically running the script and we all know anyone who's been inside dynamo knows that it's never just as easy as just click and play all the time there's there's, there's exactly this whole episode is talking about how you need to make sure that it is as easy as clicking play but that's not always the case <laughs> yeah so in regards to like the generative design tool like when you hit export what it does is it will actually put the dy in and then a dot dependencies folder uh, within it that way it can resolve so oh, neat it'll bundle the packages you use. So and if you want to really quickly, is that what exactly. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So if you want to bundle like a zip file to give someone, you can just use a generative design tool, <laughs> export it out, zip this stuff up and send it over as well. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, there are like some paid solutions. So data shapes, a very popular dynamo package mm -hmm. as well. Here's a whole tool called orchestra that manages dependencies for you. Mm -hmm. And it, basically replaces dynamo player it is paid but uh it is an awesome tool yeah as somebody well. actually um, just mentioned that in the chat too i think uh who just mentioned it uh daniel i think daniel did awesome man and i think i think data shapes was on here actually someone from data shapes um awesome sweet uh yep. so one last question i think and we'll wrap this up beth had a great question which is um when do you, when, when you find these discrepancies in the in the custom packages um, do you update and refresh the graphs or do you revert to old packages? So I'll so typically, like... <laughs> re, I'll, I'll make it adopt what's current. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'll try not to depend on an old version of something. Uh, generally speaking, most of the popular packages won't break things like crazy. I try not to at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I always try to target what the most recent version is that you're using or else mm -hmm. you'll just run into other stuff. I, yeah, I, I would I would say that that would have been my answer too. The only thing my my caveat there would be, if if the pack if the new version of the package doesn't have that tool anymore for some reason or that node, which does happen sometimes, then maybe you're you're talking about a whole issue. But yeah, I would say if if you're, I would that's that, that's you know my suggestion would be yeah you update the graph however you can to the latest version of that. Yeah, and update everyone yeah. else's machines to make sure they have the latest version of that package, right? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it was a bigger problem, like for me in rhythm, when I went from Python to C sharp, because I was replacing nodes, um, mm -hmm. some got retired in the process. Um, but yeah, and there's even stuff like the dynamo team, they, um, they're adopting certain nodes, um, as well from, from people's packages. So like rhythm, there's actually a few nodes from rhythm that are going to be out of the box soon. So I actually have like a, a watch list on my GitHub for that. All these nodes are rhythm nodes that are going to be out of the box Dynamo in the next nice. probably year or two. As they so be. as that starts to happen, <laughs> you'll have to replace um, those nodes with mm -hmm. the out of the box versions. So in that awesome. case, you'd want to target the newest one, right? Right, right, right. So yeah. Awesome, man. Well, this has been amazing. Is there any any final words before we say goodbye? Because where uh, people are still uh, hanging out, but I think we're, I think at some point I've got to go back to work myself. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure I'll share a fortune too. cookie I sure got. Yeah, too. like <laughs> so uh, I, I actually got this fortune in a fortune cookie. So like nice. I always try to have fun with what I'm doing. I kind of like tell people to always try to do that too, um, so that way they can share and uh, have fun. Uh, the more you share, the bigger your world gets as well. There, you said there's 150 people on here that perhaps we wouldn't even have ran into before. So it's kind of like 
embracing like a sharing mentality is really cool and just having fun with it is really cool as well because you learn and other people learn um and i always like this quote too um just you're not wasting time when you're learning if you're having fun and kind of goofing around it kind of seems like that sometimes and if people start to make you feel that way don't let them get to you just kind of have fun with it and help others and we'll all learn and do awesome stuff hopefully awesome man john thank you so much for coming on um for sure uh guys you can find john at 60 seconds revit on twitter or is it 60 seconds revit.com as well the blog the right i think so yep yep <laughs> all right so i was answering so, a question yeah i'm sorry i i couldn't remember if, if if it was um is it the number 60 or the word 60 for the blog for the blog it's uh it's the number the the, the, the whole word okay yeah. perfect. well either way i, will I have think all the other the one redirects yeah I will have all the links uh, to where you can where you can reach out and contact John um, on the blog post tomorrow morning, as well as the description here on YouTube. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank John for joining me. Um, and any anything he mentioned, we'll make sure I'll make sure I get any of the data sets. Anything John is willing to share, I will make sure all of that is also posted on the blog, so you guys all have access to it. Um, feel free to reach out to me, um, uh, and make sure you subscribe here on YouTube. Uh, and that's it. I think everyone have a have a wonderful weekend. John, thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, I'll see everyone next week. Uh, same day, different time. I'll be I'll be shooting out information on that. <laughs> and with that, uh, I bid you all adieu. John, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Bye, everyone.